and thank you so much. Thank you all. I am, uh, I am so happy to be here. Thank you all very much. I, um, I, I am a little bit uh, overwhelmed. Uh, we have a, a full overflow room, uh, several hundreds of people, and we have several hundreds more outside still trying to get in. So we're going to go ahead, but we're hoping that more people do get in uh, because I want everybody to have a chance. It's exciting. We're moving toward the Illinois primary. This turnout tonight, I think, shows you all know what's at stake. The stakes are high in this election, and everybody needs to come out and vote in the Illinois primary. I want to thank uh, your state senator, Terry Link. I want to thank Lauren Beth Gash. I want to thank Congresswoman Jan Schakowsky. I want to thank Jeff Fujiro, the executive director here of the Park District, but mostly I want to thank all of you. Thanks for coming out tonight on 24 hours notice. You know, I, I feel particularly uh, kind of a little emotional. I am a child of Chicago and the suburbs. I. I was born in, the Chica in, in Chicago. I grew up in Park Ridge. I was thinking, when, when I was growing up, Libertyville and Vernon Hills were like way out in the country. And I had great public schools, a great park district, an amazingly supportive neighborhood. And I am so grateful that I come from this part of the country that I've had so many wonderful experiences. I have friends literally going back to kindergarten. Some of them are here tonight. They've promised never to tell you everything they know about me, which is kind of hard since I think you know everything there is to know. But I really always feel very much at home. And so being here tonight is a special pleasure. I wanted to make a couple of points because as Ryan said, as Ryan said, I really do want to break down barriers. I'm running for president so that everybody in our country can have a chance to live up to his or her God-given potential. I feel so fortunate. I feel so fortunate that I was given opportunities. Not that there weren't obstacles then, and there certainly are obstacles today, but I had a chance to really feel like I could move forward in life, that I could be part of knocking down barriers. And as I came of age, we had the civil rights movement. We had the beginning of the women's movement. We had so much change going on. And now I see a lot of people feeling like they're not going to be able to get ahead or stay ahead. And that, to me, is fundamentally unfair. So what I want to do is break down barriers, starting with economic barriers, so that every person can have a good job with a rising income and feel like you're going to go further, your kids are going to go even farther, and that you truly will enjoy the American dream, just like we were told over generations. And what does that mean? It means good jobs in infrastructure, advanced manufacturing. It means more small businesses getting started and growing. That's where most of our jobs come from. It means combating climate change with more clean, renewable energy jobs. Now, everything I just mentioned, those are jobs that have to be done right here in Illinois and in America. Those are jobs that can't be exported. Those are jobs that have a ladder into and even beyond the middle class. When I talk about infrastructure, I want us to be globally competitive. And we no longer are. Our roads, our bridges, our tunnels, our ports, our airports are just not what they need to be in order for us to have the chance to really be as competitive as we possibly can. This morning I was in Tampa. 
Tampa has a huge port, but they've got to be able to expand that port because new ships that are much bigger are going to be coming through the Panama Canal. Now, I mention that because that's how we have to start thinking. How do we make jobs here in America? How do we attract more opportunities here? Well, we've got to make the investments, and the investments in infrastructure is one of the ways that we will be more competitive and more productive. And when I talk about manufacturing, look, that was a great way into the middle class for generations of Americans. Now we are in a fight to be able to preserve jobs and attract more jobs. We do need to change the tax code so it doesn't reward businesses that export jobs. And for any business that has gotten government tax breaks, like Nabisco in Chicago, they should have to pay back every penny if they're going to move jobs out of this state and our country. And when I talk about small business, you know, my dad was a small businessman. It was really small business. It was him and my mother, my brothers and I. He had a small print, fa uh, fabric printing business in Chicago. And we would go and help him, you know, print fabrics. And occasionally he'd hire, you know, one or two other people on a short-term basis. But I saw how much he loved being his own boss. I saw how hard he worked to give us a good quality of life. We were always at the very top in the world in creating small businesses. We aren't anymore. And we've got to get back to doing that. And the fastest growing small businesses are ones headed by minority and women-owned firms. And so part of it, part of us have to recognize that we have to do more to get access to credit to small businesses, support small businesses, I'm excited by that. I've said I want to be a small business president, and that's exactly what I will do. We also need to raise the minimum wage because two-thirds of all minimum wage workers are women, most of them supporting themselves and their children, and a lot of them barely able to keep going even when they work full-time. And at some point in this country, if you work full-time and you do your part, you should not end up in poverty at the end of the year. <laughs> so the other thing, you know, one of the fastest ways to raise incomes in America is to guarantee women get equal pay for the work that we do. You know, I always say, this is not a woman's issue. It's a fairness issue. Yes, it is. It's also a family issue. It's an economic issue. And I think it's time we recognize that we want to grow the economy. We are a 70% consumption economy. So when people are not paid what they should be paid, that doesn't only hurt them. It hurts our whole economic activity. And it slows down economic growth. So when I talk about all of these things that I, <clears throat> excuse me, just mentioned, you know, the Republicans don't support any of them. They don't think we need more infrastructure jobs. You know, they're not interested in saving manufacturing and creating more. In fact, their attitude is, we're just not going to make things anymore in America. I just disagree with that. You've got to have a productive economy, and that includes a large group of Americans who are making things, whether it's computer parts or food or any other product. And they don't believe in climate change, so they don't support clean, renewable energy jobs. I've set some big goals. I want us to deploy a half a billion more solar panels in the next five years. And I want us to have enough clean, renewable energy to power every home in 10 years. And you know, sometimes when I say this, I get a lot of excited response, but then I do see some skeptical looks. But let me please tell you, I have traveled all over this country. We have states 
that are already at one third to 40 percent of their electricity coming from renewable sources, mostly wind and solar. We have the capacity to do so much more and think of the jobs that we will create as well as going into a transition to clean renewable energy, which is very much in our interest. When I was in South Florida last night, they're having floods in Miami Beach because the tides are already getting so high. You look at a map of where the worst consequences of climate change will be, well, South Florida is at the top. So people have a direct interest in not only preventing the effects of climate change, including bad weather patterns, but also saving their property, saving their investments, investing in resilience. This is not only a necessity, it's an economic opportunity. So I'm gonna continue to lay out a jobs program. You know, it's easy to say what you're against. It's easy to tear down other people. What we gotta start doing in America again is decide what we're for, get to work, roll up our sleeves, and start building that future. And I am very excited about it. You know, I listened to some of the other candidates. They are so pessimistic, so negative about us. I'll tell you, that's not how I see us and our country. First of all, I don't think you make America great by tearing down everything that made America great in the first place. Instead, I believe that our best years could still be ahead of us. I look at these young people, that's what I want for you. I want you to believe that, and I want us to work to achieve that. Now, another barrier we've got to keep tearing down is access to health care. And yes, I am very proud of what's been accomplished, because you know, before they called it Obamacare, they called it Hillary Care. And I tried very hard. I took on the drug companies and I took on the insurance companies and they beat us. You know, it was a tough, tough effort, but they were successful in stopping the kinds of changes that we need, not only to make sure people have access to health care, but to begin to control the costs of health care. So when we were successful, I turned around and said, what can we do? And I helped to create the Children's Health Insurance Program. It was a bipartisan effort. Eight million kids are taken care of because of it. You know, I've said many times, I am a progressive who likes to get things done. That's growing up here in Chicago, knowing that at the end of the day, you have to show what you've done. What have you accomplished? So I was thrilled when the president got the Affordable Care Act passed because we have been trying to figure out a way to build on our system. You know, if we were starting over, if we hadn't built the system we did starting after World War II, you know, maybe we'd be picking something else. But most people still get their health insurance from their employer. We have the Medicare program. We have the Medicaid program. We have the VA program. We have the Children's Health Insurance Program, and now we have the Affordable Care Act, which helps to bridge the gap. We are now at 90% coverage in America, and we have, we have, thanks to the hard work of a lot of people, been able to insure an additional 20 million people. And I wanna tell you something. People come up to me all the time and thank me for defending the Affordable Care Act. And oftentimes they say something that's pretty dramatic. I had a woman say to me, thank you for defending it, it saved my life. I said, what do you mean? She said, well, I was unemployed and then I got a job that didn't have any insurance, so I didn't go to the doctor for years. And then I finally thought, okay, the Affordable Care Act, I'm gonna try it, I got a policy, I went to the doctor. I told him I'd been having headaches after an exam, he referred me to somebody else. They told me I had brain cancer. And I mean, you know, this is what happens when you are in, in a campaign like this and I'm trying to hear people's stories. I'm trying to communicate what is happening to people, to others, so that we all understand we're in this together. And I said to her, so what's happening? He, she said, I'm being treated. And you know, I have a 
pretty fair prognosis, but I don't think I would have survived. I had a grandfather say to me, thank you for the Affordable Care Act and defending it. We had twin grandchildren and one had congenital heart problems. She's had five operations, open heart operations, this little tiny girl.